The socio-political conflicts which led to the U.S. Civil War began boiling decades before the war started. From independence, the balance of power between the North and South was a point of controversy, and compromises were already being made to stave off discontent between states which relied on heavy slave labor and those which didn't. One example of such a compromise is the Three-Fifths Compromise, a compromise between the slave states' desire to count all slaves as part of their populations in order to increase their states' political power, and the northern states' desire to exclude them from the count entirely, resulting in the compromise of counting each slave as three-fifths of a person when calculating political representation. With the purchase of the Louisiana Territory from France in the early 19th century, the continuation and spread of slavery had become a driving force in this conflict as whether or not to expand the line which had until that point marked the border between northern free states and southern slave states became a major point of contention. The decision to prohibit slavery in newly claimed territory north of the parallel 36 degrees 30 in the Missouri Compromise of 1820 solved the controversy for a time, but ultimately the decision only pushed conflict down the road. In the late 1820s, President Andrew Jackson instituted new tariffs on textiles in an effort to reduce foreign competition with American businesses in the domestic market. These tariffs most heavily affected southern states, which lacked the textile mills of the north due to their heavily slave plantation-based economies. In addition to the southern states relying on cheap foreign textiles to clothe their slaves, they relied on cotton exports to Britain to make a steady profit, and the tariffs prompted British buyers to look elsewhere to fulfill their needs. Southerners were left resentful of the federal government, and fearful that a government willing to make such supposedly unfair tariffs may go on to pass more extreme measures, such as the abolition of slavery on the national level. This sparked the development of nullification theory, which suggested that the Union was formed of sovereign states who had the right to dismiss rulings they deemed unconstitutional, and, vitally, the right to withdraw from the Union if they so chose. While civil war was averted in this case through the passage of a compromise bill, such ideas would lay the groundwork for the South seceding from the Union during the Civil War. The inverse argument, meanwhile, that the Constitution established not a union of states, but of people, and that nullification and secession were not rights of the states, would form the foundation of the position held by Unionist politicians like Abraham Lincoln. Southerners had a vested interest in westward expansion, wanting new lands for cotton farming, and to found new states in the West to boost Southern representation in Congress in order to counter the growing power and increased population size had started to bring to the industrialized northern states. Westward expansion sparked fierce debate, as the southerners furiously expanding westward hoped for a west with slavery, while northerners wanted it to be free. When America defeated Mexico in the Mexican-American War, the controversy over whether or not to allow slavery in the newly claimed territory pushed the country significantly closer to civil war. Two more factors of major significance in the lead-up to the Civil War were the legal status of slaves and the support and opposition for abolition. Legally, slaves were considered property and denied any human agency. Beyond this, black Americans in general were legally considered as a lesser class of humans and were denied full rights. In 1857, the Dred Scott decision ruled that black Americans could not be true citizens and that, even if taken to free states by their masters, they remained property. With this, the controversy between pro- and anti-slavery advocates reached a fever pitch, as the decision overwrote Republican anti-slavery policies and seemed to support the movement for national legalization of slavery. Opposition to slavery became more and more prominent throughout the 19th century, with some abolitionists even supporting full legal equality for black Americans. Many abolitionists came to their position within a religious framework and would cite Bible passages that seemed to oppose slavery supporting their positions with a text that most Americans accepted as an unquestionable moral source. The abolition movement prompted many Southerners to find ways of defending slavery, first as a neutral force, and later as an outright good. Since opposition to slavery was often framed in moral terms, some pro-slavery advocates began to argue within a similar moral framework, citing examples of slavery in the Bible, and using paternalistic language to idealize the relationship between slaves and masters, contrasting it with the supposedly colder relationships between northern bosses and their workers. The battle between abolitionists and supporters of slavery became most intense after the 1854 passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which determined that the white men living within the two new states would be allowed to vote on whether or not to allow slavery, an idea called popular sovereignty. While Nebraska quickly became a free state, Kansas became the site of an intense conflict between pro- and anti-slavery advocates, as groups on both sides recruited supporters from other parts of the country to move into Kansas and vote with them. Thousands of pro-slavery activists from Missouri streamed into Kansas on election day to illegally elect pro-slavery legislators, and abolitionists responded in kind by instituting their own illegal government based in Topeka. 
civil war erupted in Kansas, with approximately 200 settlers being killed over the course of 1856. The violence even spilled over into Congress, where, after the sack of Lawrence by a pro-slavery mob in May, anti-slavery Senator Charles Sumner was beaten with a cane by South Carolina Representative Preston Brooks after insulting Brooks's slave-owning cousin in a speech. Whether or not the Civil War could have been avoided remains an open question, but I believe that it was all but inevitable from the foundation of the country. The Southern reliance on slavery made it unlikely that they ever would have given up the institution freely, as slavery's continuation formed the very foundation of Southern society. It was equally inevitable that the abolitionist position would form, as the constitutional rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness were completely contradicted by the continuation of slavery. Finally, within months of the decision to adopt popular sovereignty in Kansas, the territory had become a metaphorical and literal battleground, and the long brewing conflict reached a fever pitch across the country. By the time people started sacking cities and massacring civilians, the devotion each side had to either destroying or preserving slavery had already become irreconcilably intense. With these tensions, it was inevitable for a national conflict over the institution's continuation to follow, with bleeding Kansas simply marking the point of no return after nearly a century of escalating division. Thank you for watching everybody. If you learned something, please consider dropping a like and commenting, and if you'd like to see more in the future, subscribe. I've been Soma, and I'll see you next time.